Uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Nam. I'm a graduate student at the Department of Biostatistics and Data Science at UT Health. The topic of my presentation is sparse dynamic basin network and its application to longitudinal genetic imaging data analysis. So first, this is the outline of my presentation. First, I will briefly talk about the motivations of our study, and then I will introduce the methodology we are using, and we also <coughs> We do some simulation to verify our model and also some real data applications and also just finally the discussion and conclusions. So first, why we want to develop such a complicated model? Uh, dynamic basin, mo uh, basin uh, network is a very useful tool to study the mechanism of uh, the change of the mechanism of a system over time. But most of the uh, study in the literature, they all focus on the stationary dynamic basin network system. That means that they assume that uh, the time series data is generated by a distribution that does not change over time. But that's definitely is not what we really want. Uh, very few literature, uh, very few publications should uh, do, do some uh, not, stand, not the stationary dynamic basic network uh, uh, models, but they require some sparsity of the network, also the transition pro, uh, process between the different time points. So what we want to do is that we want to have more freedom. Uh, for, the, uh, for, for when we are try to constructing the, 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 basic net, the dynamic network. Uh, another beauty of our uh, design is that we can uh, include some covariate in our, uh, our model. That means that when we are, for example, when we are trying to study the change of the image, the image when we are taking, they might be changed over time. But how about we want to study how the genotyping data, how the genetic data is interacting with the imaging. The genotyping data is not changed all the time. So our model can also include uh, these kind of features. Uh, uh, actually, the last is our real motivation to design such a model because we have some diffusion tense imaging on hand. Oh, time, this data is time cost data. So we want to design a model, then we can do something. We can study uh, to design a study to uh, use this data. So first, the key methodology in our model is called the sparse dynamic structure equation model. Uh, basically, we have a, a, a specific type t, t. We have the y variable. Also, we have the, the variables in the previous time point. Uh, also, we have the s variable, which is the covariate. So this is the matrix form. Sorry. This is the, uh, the, last, uh, the last row is the matrix form of our, uh, of our modeling. After we are feeding this model, we can kind of have some direct network, but this network is now a silic. That means that they can have some loopback. So we also use integer programming to help us to remove the loopback. Then it will be really a DAG graph. So for the, uh, for the uh, sparse dimension structure equation, uh, this is the, uh, the, uh, the, here is the objective function. Uh, because we want to control the, uh, the complexity of the network, we also save some error penalty. Due to the error penalty, this problem cannot have analytical solution. So we use the decimal grading method to solve the problem. So after we get a model, we, want to, we, 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 we try to do some simulation to see the performance of our model. So we, first, we generate uh, one million observations, and also we generate some genotyping data by using the 1,000 genome project, and then we apply three different methods to the data to see, to evaluate the performance of the model. The first one is the, uh, the sparse dynamic structure equation model with integer programming. The other one is the sparse dynamic structure equation model alone. And then the last one is uh, the uh, dynamic basin level model in the BN strut uh, package. So to evaluate uh, the performance of the model, we use two different parameters. One is the power of detection. That means the number of detected edge divided by the number of rear edge. The, uh, the other one is the false de detection rate. That means the number of false edge um, is divided by the number of edge we calculate. So it, in the first scenario, we, have, we choose uh, 10 variables. And we set the number of sniff to, to zero. And the last one is the noise to add to the system. Uh, from this curve, we can see that the sparse dynamic structure equation model have very high power, and the sparse dynamic structure equation model with integer programming have a, 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 a little bit lower power. But this, uh, the structure equation model with 
uh, integer programming, they can achieve very lower uh, false positive rate, false detection rate. In this in this situation, it's about fifteen uh, about fifteen percent. So we further increase the number of variables. We keep all the situation the same. We can see the performance is similar. And then we also want to see how about the noise? How about the noise play in uh, will affect the performance of, mo of our model? So we further increase the level of the noise. We see it that the performance is kind of consistent. And the structures, dynamic structure equation models still have very high power. And then the performance for the power performance for that structure, structure, dynamic structure equation model with integer programming is, is uh, a little bit lower than the SDSE alone, but the uh, false detection rate is very, very low in the sparse dynamic structure equation model with integer programming. So we keep increasing, in as similar, we increase the number of variables, we see the pattern is very, it, it is kind of consistent. So next we want to do is that we want to add some SNPs, we want to add some covariate. So we generate 10 SNPs from the 1,000 genome project and then we add to the model. Because the, the, the package I'm using to compare, we cannot include the covariate. So I just only compare the, the, the two methods we are developing. And the chain is the same. The, S, the SDSE trying to have the highest power, but the SDSE with integer programming can, can achieve very low detail the false detection rate. In this situation, the, uh, the false discovery rate is uh, just about 0.8%. And then we, keep, we try to increase the number of variables and the chain is similar. And it looks like the, when we are trying to in, in, include some covariance in our system, that means that we can borrow some more information from outside, then the performance <coughs> of the false, uh, false discovery rate can further imp improve. So now we have a model, we, uh, we believe that its, uh, its performance is reasonably well, and then we try to apply a model to study some real world problems. First, and this is the data we get. We get some diffusion tensor imaging data, at, at five different time points, it's baseline, three months, six months, 12 months, and 24 months. We download the data from the Atony, the Atony data set, and in total we have about 200, after the data cleaning, we have 200, and 28 individuals, and the, a single image dimension is, is 110 by 110 by 110, and then each wall star is about a two millimeter cubit. So, but when we have the data, the first thing we need to do is to, we need to deal with the missing, missing values, especially for the imaging data, some people come at the baseline, but they may not come at the follow up, so we have a lot of uh, missing image, so we need to figure out uh, uh, protocol to deal with the uh, <coughs> missing image. So in, in, the, in our study, we decided, uh, we used the strategy combining the 3D functional principle component analysis and also the matrix completion to deal with uh, this scenario. Uh, this is objective function for the functional, uh, 3D functional uh, principle component analysis. And the constraint, the first constraint is kind of normalize the direction when we are trying to get, the, uh, try to get the direction that can measure the variance. The second, the, second, the second constraint is kind of penalty for the smoothness of the curve. So, and then we use matrix completion, then we can borrow the information for all the adjacent time points, and then we can try use it to do the imputation of our image. So, I, so now I, I, let me show you the performance of image, image imputation. First, this is the, statist, uh, the basic statistics for our image data, only at the the baseline have all the image, and the missing rate at all the other time points are about 50%. So in our uh, uh, imputation test, we, we, we first extract all the 64 individuals, they all, they have the data in all the five time points, and then we sleep them into training and test data set. In the training data set, we have 34 FA image, FA image, and in the test data set, we have uh, 30 FA image, and then, we do the 3 FAPCA and we do the uh, matrix completion. So this is the one, one slice of one image in the 30 in the test data image data set. And then after imputation, we get kind of uh, image can, we get an imputed, imputed image by only using the first FPC scores. And then we can see that we do miss some details of, that, uh, of the original image, but generally speaking, I think we can capture most of the information. So we believe that uh, 
this, re, uh, this result is good enough for us to do the following analysis. So after that, we, because even, uh, after we, uh, after we do, doing some imputation of the image, the image is still too big. It's about 91 times 109 times 91. That's a lot of world cells. It's very naive to run the analysis on all the world cells because it's very time consuming and the com complexity of the network is kind of unimpredictable. So we try to do some segmentation. We use the, we use super as a tool and to try to and segment the, the whole brain image into 19 different subregions. And then this is, the la this is the label of all the 19, the 19 subregions. And then we run our model. We try to study how the, uh, the, the information flow is changing in our brain over the time. So this is our baseline image. During our, uh, after we are running the study, we do observe some interesting phenomenon, but we are still working with our neuroscience, sorry, neuroscience collaborator to see what's the bar, real biological insight. For example, in the baseline, we can see there are two hand nodes, the second one, which is corresponding to the frontal lobe of our brain, and also the segment six, which corresponds to the temporal lobe of our brain. We can see there are a lot of connections between, is between the segment one and segment six, and they are, have a direct link from segment one to segment six. And then we keep going to the, the next time point at the three months. We can still see some connection between the segment one and segment six, and there is a direct link from segment one to segment six. But we can see the network structure is kind of key changing over the time. And interesting, when we go to the six month, because over the time, more and more people are tending to have Alzheimer's disease. And then at the, at the six months, the information flow from seven one and seven, between seven one and seven C, they completely reverse. Now the information is flow from seven six to seven one, and then we keep moving. The, train, the changing pattern is, key, 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 is kind of consistent because we still, from seven six, if you want to go to seven one, it went to some paths, but the direction is still from six to one. And then, to the last time point. The network is changing and we still observe the inverse of the information flow between the sec second one and the second six. And it looks like the past is, is a bit longer. And then we are, we are biostatisticians, so we don't have too much knowledge uh, in the neuroscience. And so we are sending our results to our collaborator and we are working with them to see what this kind of uh, finding can help us to better understanding the mechanism in our brain. So in conclusion, we developed uh, SDSE IP model to learn the non-stationary dynamic basic network. And uh, the one beauty of our model is that we don't, do not uh, restrict the sparsity of the network and also the, trans the transition pattern between the time. Uh, and also hopefully our, uh, our de develop, uh, algorithm can not only can fit to the image data or the gene expression data, we hope that our development model can also use to solve some other real world problem that in, with time cost data. I think that's all for my presentation. Any questions? So questions for our speaker? Um, so for your data, did you process uh, changes from one time to another, or did you just do each time slice uh, analysis by itself? We do the, we, we, combine all, we use all the five data points, putting put it in, in the model all together, and then we generate, we gen, we're fitting some coefficients to evaluate, evaluate the network. So we, we, we generally consider all the time point information. Other questions? Other questions? So I have a question. So have you looked at using this in any other data sets other than uh, MRI imaging? And this is the first data set we are using, is probably, and I think in very soon we will try, we also try to use this um, model to apply to the gene expression data. Then we will we further see how the performance looks like. Very interesting. Okay, let's thank our speaker one more time.